This sermon is titled Book Study Acts chapter 5 and 6. Be enriched as you listen. Good morning everyone. Are you ready for your exam? No, just joking. So for those of you who are just visiting us as a church community, we are journeying through the book of Acts. Uh we typically cover two chapters each Sunday and today we are going to cover acts chapters 5 and 6 and what we are doing as a congregation is reading these chapters before we come to the service so that you know we will just get a summary of it our goal is to bring out some practical and spiritual insights from these chapters that we can take and apply into our own lives and uh, as you read these chapters most likely you would have already observed these things and it's good to have them reaffirmed and reiterated to you uh during the Sunday service so i just want to point out that as the book of acts and as the events in the book of acts were unfolding many of the epistles were also being written which we will see later on so understanding what was happening in the book of acts is also going to help us understand the epistles because then you get a background this is this is the reason why that particular epistle was written i'm not saying all the epistles but a majority of the epistles the letters of paul were written as acts was unfolding as things were happening these letters were written and so when you read the epistles you're able to connect and say oh that was what was happening this is why this was written and so it makes a lot of sense when you go back and later on when we study the epistles so we are in acts chapter 5 and by this time uh, the the community of believers in jerusalem is a thriving community estimated to be over 12,000 people spirit filled wonderful people praising god worshiping god meeting in the temple in solomon's porch that would be the common place where they would gather together in big groups as well as they were meeting from house to house having a lot of fellowship praising serving god there was a lot of favor the church was growing and we also saw towards the end of chapter 4 that people were being generous spontaneously nobody was forcing them saying you know you have to sell your land or so on and so forth but there was a tremendous need because there were some people who were local who were from Jerusalem they were the hebrews they were jews who primarily spoke aramaic or hebrew they were locals but they had a majority of out of town jews foreigners meaning these were jews who were dispersed who had come to Jerusalem primarily to celebrate the feasts but they had an unplanned overstay in Jerusalem so they didn't have much with them and so now that number was huge thousands and so they had to be cared for and so people were contributing spontaneously of their possessions to care for these people some of them went and sold lands and properties and uh they would go back to their town homes places where they came from sell it bring money and lay it at the apostles feet and the apostles would then distribute it so in acts chapter 5 we see acts 5 verses 1 to 11 the record of the first problem in the church and the first problem in the church had to do with money and i think it hasn't stopped being a problem in many places so here you have a couple now keep this in mind this is a godly couple a spiritual couple they are part of the church community they're growing together they're receiving the teaching and so everything is wonderful and they have a very good thought which is we also want to give to help out with the needs the only problem is this It seemed like now the passage doesn't tell us this we're just drawing inference it seemed like they really loved money so they wanted to keep a little part for themselves 
at the same time, it seemed like they wanted to get all the attention, make a pretense that they're actually giving the full amount. So I don't know, you know how the conversations took place, if any, but this was the problem. They kept back apart and they pretended, which is hypocrisy, they pretended they're bringing the full amount. They kept back part of it because they wanted that. Now keep in mind that everything was voluntary. Nobody was telling them that you have to sell, you have to bring. No, it was all spontaneous. So they could have kept the land and not sold it. Or they could have sold it and kept a portion of it and then brought only a portion. They said, hey, this is a portion of what we wanted to give. It's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. And so as we look at what happened, the first thing is this. Peter calls it out. How did Peter know about it? It's through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Through the word of knowledge, through the discerning of spirits. And these gifts are still in operation in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. So the word of knowledge where God reveals a certain piece of information. Something's happening in people's lives or some, some details. It reveals it. And the discerning of spirits, which one aspect is to know what is going on in the hearts of people. To discern what's there. To see into what's there. And so through the gifts of the spirit, Peter calls it out. Ananias comes and Peter says, you know, Ananias... Why have you lied? You haven't lied to men, but you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, this lie is not to men, but to God. So we get a very important insight that the Holy Spirit is God. I want us to understand that. It's very simple, but very important. The Holy Spirit is not wind. Wind is used as a picture to describe His work. The Holy Spirit is not fire. Fire is used to describe His work. The Holy Spirit is not rain. Rain is used to describe His work. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's part of the Godhead. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. He's co-equal with the Father and with the Son. The Holy Spirit is fully God. He's not one-third God. Now sometimes when we hear people say, the first person of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity. We think Father below Him, Son below Him, Holy Spirit. No, no, no. The co-equal. So actually using that language is, is, is not correct. We just should say God the Father, God the Eternal Word, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit, and, and God the Holy Spirit. He's co-equal. The Holy Spirit fully represents the Father and the Son. All that the Father is, all that the Son is, are fully expressed through the Spirit. So he's, he's to be worshipped just as we worship the Father and the Son. So that's an important truth that comes out there in Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. He says, you haven't lied to men, but you've lied to God. But now here is the big question. The big question is, what happened there? Both Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead. So, oh, that's quite a big punishment was doing something like this. After all, they did bring some money. Why such a serious punishment? We could also ask them additional questions. I mean, what about all the other believers? I'm sure they all had some little problems here and there. None of them were perfect. Did they all drop dead in their homes or something? Why only these two? And you can ask another question. Why doesn't it happen now? Most of us would have been dead by now, but no. I'm just joking. But why? Now the Bible doesn't tell us. We just have to try and understand it. And here's what I would like to put, up, put, put before us. What was happening in the church at that time? We are now in the first, about the first four years of the church. What was happening? We saw in Acts 4 verse 33 that there was great grace. And there was great power or glory among this community. So there is a biblical principle. To whom much is given, much is required. It's a biblical principle. God was pouring out much grace. He was pouring out much glory upon on this community of believers. The only community of believers at that time where the Holy Spirit was moving. Much grace, much glory. And what we can infer is 
when God gives much grace and much glory, he also expects great reverence. Where there is great grace, great glory, there must be great reverence or great fear of God. Or he can also state this. Where there is great grace and great glory, there is low tolerance for sin. The threshold is low because the standards are very high. God expects more. We don't see this in the church today, most likely because we are not in that place. We're experiencing that much grace and glory on display in our midst. Yes, we all have received grace, but the Bible says there is more grace. Yes, we all are experiencing the goodness and the glory of God, but there is more glory because God is infinite. But the thing is this, we read this in Haggai chapter 2, where God says the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. The way God works is he always ends much, much grander and bigger than the beginning. And he is bringing the church into a place where the church is going to be a glorious church. Jesus is not coming back for a weak, wimpy, good-for-nothing, powerless church. He's coming back for a glorious church. And the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. So let's get ready for it. Let's expect that. Let's pray for it. God always finishes better than he begins. So if the book of Acts is the beginning, the ending is going to be much more greater. That means the church is going to be brought into a place where we are going to experience great grace and great glory. And when we begin to experience those things, remember, God expects great fear or great reverence. Can't play around. Peter also highlights something. He says, why has Satan filled your heart? Acts 5 verse 3. Why has Satan filled your heart? What a strange thing to tell believers. I mean, these are believers. Ananias and Sapphira. And what's Peter saying? Why has Satan filled your heart? So, it's a warning for us. That even though we are believers, we love Jesus... If there are things in our lives that actually open the door, and in their case, it was probably the love of money and the love of praise from man, recognition from man, which opened the door. While that intention was good, which is to give some money, they had these underlying wrong motivations, which opened the door and Satan came in with this evil plan. And so they colluded, the husband and wife colluded. So it's a lesson for us. We've got to always keep doors closed. Be on guard. Don't let the enemy come in. And even though you're, you're intending to do a good thing in that, because of certain wrong motivations, in this case, he came in and he put a wrong idea and they just went with it. And so Peter rebuked them. Why has Satan filled your mind, your thinking? This is demonic. This idea, this thing of deception was demonic. The last thing I just point out there, he says, you know, in doing this, you were actually testing the Spirit of God. Verse 9. You were testing the Spirit of God. So what do you mean to test God? It's like, God, let me see if you can do this. Right? Let me see if you're actually seeing me. They may not have said it in those many words, but their actions implied that. Let's see if God can catch us. You're testing God. So any deception against the house of God is really a testing of the Spirit of God. And the thing is, He will shine His light to expose our darkness. So these are lessons we need to take away. And, now, and I just want to impress on our hearts that and as much as we talk about the grace and the goodness of God, let us never forget reverence for God. Both in our personal lives and in the ministry. 
2 Corinthians 7, 1 tells us that we are to perfect holiness in the fear of God. That means we are, we are pursuing holiness out of reverence for God. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 tells us that we must serve God with reverence and godly fear. So you're serving God, but there has to be this essence or this element of reverence and godly fear of God. We don't take it lightly. Are you all with me? So God, having dealt with this very, you know, having dealt with this sin in a very serious way. The next thing we see, Acts 5, 12 to 16, is the church begins to just flourish. We see another surge of exponential, explosive growth. In the early church, Acts 5, 12 to 16, the Bible tells us here that a great, great, the disciples, number of disciples greatly multiplied, increased. And they held the apostles, uh, no one would dare join them. They held them with honor, with high esteem as they continued to meet. And it also tells us that, that People were being healed and delivered. And, and they brought the sick people from the neighboring cities around Jerusalem. They started coming in. They said, let's bring our sick there. People are being healed to the hands of the apostles. Many signs and miracles were being done. And multitudes are coming into the city to receive healing, to receiving deliverance. Amen. I want us as a church to pray for Acts 5, 12 to 16 to happen for us. Amen? Now some would say, oh, that was for the early church. That's the DNA. That's who we're supposed to be. And in fact, we're supposed to be better because the glory of the latter is supposed to be greater than the former. So we have to see more, more, more of it. So let's begin to pray. Say, God, we want these things. We want to see the book of Acts reproduced in us times 10. You know, Ten times more. We want to see that happen. Acts 5, 12 to 16 should happen in us, in our midst. People should be coming on, you know, coming in to us. And not just us as a local church, but to the body of Christ in our city. Should be coming in saying, we want to experience God. We want to receive healing. We want to receive deliverance. Coming in. That's what was happening there. And God began to do something unusual. Through this one man called Peter, God, now the Bible says through the hands of all the apostles, mighty things were being done. But through Peter, God said, God started using his shadow to heal people. Think about that. That's very unusual. Now, you know, if we are very serious about the Bible, we say, where else in the Bible did that happen? Show me. It never happened through Jesus. So Peter is a false prophet or false apostle. His shadow is healing people. He's practicing black, black magic. No, no, no. Relax. The Bible says, Psalm 115 verse 3, God is in the heavens and He does as He pleases. So if He wants to use somebody's shadow to heal people, so be it. Amen. But you look through the Bible and there's always God do, God always did unusual things. For instance, in a man named Moses, he used his rod. Show me where else, who else was doing, had a miracle rod ministry. Moses. In Elijah, in Elijah's case, he used the mantle. Blanket ministry, miracle blanket. Show me who else had a miracle blanket. Even Jesus didn't. But they took Elijah's mantle, his blanket, and he struck the waters. The waters divided. Made axe, the axe head float. Then you read about Paul, or you read about Jesus. He had miracle clay ministry. In some occasions, he spit on the ground, made clay, put mud, put it on people's eyes. Miracle mud, you know. Who else did it? Oh, just God choosing to do it that way. I'm not saying we all have to be weird, but I'm just saying if God wants us to do something a certain way, just do it. 
Paul prayed over handkerchiefs and they went and they had miracle cloth ministry. <laughs> People being healed through the handkerchiefs. Now, of course, we all have to be discerning. We have to test. How do you test it? One, is Jesus being glorified? Two, are people really being helped? It's not an emotional thing. It's not a hype. It's not some hypnotism. But people are genuinely being healed and delivered. Three, are people being pointed to Jesus? Because the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. So when the Holy Spirit is working, the person who is exalted and glorified is Jesus. So three simple tests. Is Jesus being exalted? Are people really being helped? Are people being pointed to Jesus? And they should, no, that's, that's of God. Yes, it's outside of our general understanding. But that's God. And so if God chooses to work in unusual ways, even in our midst, so be it. It's okay. Welcome it. It could be simple things. It could be big things. It's fine. Now last Sunday I heard an interesting uh, testimony. There was somebody visiting us from Germany. Again, a family that moved there. They were just visiting back. And they still connect and watch our services online. And so but they were listening to our Acts 1 and 2 uh, in the living room. And their eight-year-old son in their living room started praying in tongues. And they're watching from Germany. Oh, it's wonderful. So show me where it's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. But God will work as He pleases. Amen? So He just began to pray in tongues. And thank God for that. So God would do different things, wonderful things. Just be open. So now the church is growing and there's just amazing work happening in that community. And we want to be that kind of a community, an Acts 5, 12 to 16 community. And then, as always, the religious leaders got angry. And this time, they rounded up all 12 of the apostles and put them in the common prison. Previously, it was two, Peter and John, Acts 5, verse 17. They get all the 12 of the apostles, put them in prison. And here something unusual happens that night. In the early hours of the morning, the 12 apostles are all there. And the Bible says an angel of God comes. He opens the prison doors. And he leads the apostles out. And he tells them, go stand in the temple and preach to the people all the words of this life. Go preach. It's amazing. The apostles go boldly into the temple and they start preaching to the people all the words of this life about the life of Christ and the life in Jesus Christ. Now I just want to point out, why didn't the angel him, her, angel I don't want to say himself, herself, itself. <laughs> Why didn't the angel itself preach? Because we are in a dispensation, a time, an age, when the responsibility to preach the gospel is put upon the church, not the angels. The angels are ministering spirits. They come and assist us, but we do the proclamation. There will come a time, which we see in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter, when after the church is raptured and in the second half of the seven years of tribulation, in Revelation 14, we see four angels who are proclaiming the eternal gospel, who are warning people. And they are angels, they're doing the work that time because the church is taken away. But right now the church is here. It's the church's responsibility to keep proclaiming the gospel. The angels assist us. Amen? Then we may also ask the question, hey, why don't we see some jailbreaks today? It'll come in the news. Why don't we see that happening today? I don't know, but we should pray for those things. We should ask for those things. But one thing that I could point to is, what do you think all the believers were doing that night when the 12 apostles were in prison? Any guess? They must have been praying that whole night. Because we see them doing that later on in Acts 11 when Peter was in prison. They prayed the whole night. They had an all night prayer meeting. I think that, that, that probably is the reason why we're not seeing such dramatic, amazing deliverances. And they did. We need to get together and do some things like that. Amen. So they're there. 
The next morning, the guard goes on his round. He's sent by the priest saying, get the prisoners in. Get the prisoners out. And he says, goes back, says, the jail doors are locked, but nobody's inside. And then he gets the news. Hey, your prisoners are out there in the temple. They are preaching. So the Sanhedrin says, bring them in. And so you try to imagine this. This is the Jewish Supreme Court. The 70s elders, leaders of the Sanhedrin are there. And the 12 apostles are brought to trial. And they say, did we not strictly charge you not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus? But you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching about Jesus. They're angry. They're mad now. And Peter responds, three-point sermon, Acts 5, 29, 30, 31, 32. Peter says, first of all, whom should we obey? Should we obey you or should we obey God? Same thing he said earlier. He's sticking to the same thing. Whom are we to obey? Are we to obey man or are we to obey Second, he points to the risen Christ. You have killed the prince of life whom God has raised up from the dead. In other words, look, I'm not preaching a myth or a superstition. I am preaching about resurrection. And the Sadducees get mad when they hear about resurrection because they deny the resurrection. And he's slapping it on their face. This Jesus has been raised from the dead. And third, beautiful, verse 32, Peter says, And we are his witnesses and the Holy Spirit with us. Put your right hand up and say this with me. I am a witness for the living Jesus and the Holy Spirit with me. Say it one more time. I am a witness of the living Jesus and the Holy Spirit with me. Beautiful. So this is a common thing. Peter always points to the resurrection of Jesus. Whom you killed, he's alive. Whom you killed, he's alive. He's pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And today you and I are called to bear witness to a risen Jesus. Not a theological Jesus. Not a Jesus of history. Not a good teacher or a good philosopher. We're talking about the risen King of kings and Lord of lords. The one who is eternal. The omnipotent one. The eternal one. The one who dwells in unapproachable light. The one whose heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. That's the one we are giving witness to. Amen? Amen. Good. You can clap. <laughs> Amen. That's whom we are giving witness to. And the good news is, you and I are not alone. Peter said, we are his witness and the Holy Spirit with us. So in your office, in your school, in your college, wherever you are, when you are speaking of Jesus, remember, you're not alone. The Holy Spirit is with you. He's right there. He's a person. He's God. He's with you. So you might be doing the speaking, but the Holy Spirit is your strengthener. He is your empowerer. He is your equipper. He is the one who's giving you the boldness. He's right there with you. And Peter recognized that. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm standing here. I'm not alone. Holy Spirit's with me. So you can imagine the 70 people. Peter says, I'm a witness. And the Holy Spirit is a witness with me. And so the sin, he didn't get really mad. They say, we want to kill these apostles. Finish all 12 of them. Let's finish. And they have the power to do it. They could come up with some excuse. You know, these are blasphemers. These are people who are saying all these things. Let's kill them. They're ready to do it. But there was one man. His name was Gamaliel. He was a very respected teacher. Saul, who later became the great apostle Paul, studied under Gamaliel. And Gamaliel said, hey, let's think about this. So they got the apostles aside and Gamaliel spoke up. And what he said was so profound. He reminded them that 
in the recent past, there were two other men who rose up and who you know, got people to follow them. But when they died, everything went dead, dissipated. So he, spe- he tells them, excuse me. So Gamaliel tells them, be careful what you do to these men. And he puts this in, in front of the table. He says, <coughs> if this work is of men, it will die. But if it's of God, two things. Be careful that you find yourself fighting God. And second, you cannot stop the work of God. And so that brings sense to them. They agree. Two takeaways. One, God can use somebody in a court, in a council. They may not necessarily be believers, but he can use somebody to speak sense on your behalf. That's what he did for them. Gamaliel spoke up, but there's no indication he was a believer in Jesus. But he spoke wisdom that helped keep the apostles alive. Otherwise, they could have been dead by the end of the day. So God can do that. He can speak through somebody to present some wisdom on the table that will save you, save me in such situations. Secondly, this is a test, a plumb line that you and I can use. If something that we're thinking about, if it's of ourselves, it will die a natural death eventually. But if it is of God, no man and no devil can stop it. When God gives you a thought, when God gives you an idea, when God gives you a commission, when God gives you an assignment and you are moving out on a God-given assignment, when you are moving out on a God-given mission, no man on earth and no devil from hell can stop it. Nobody. Amen. That's what what Gamaliel was presenting. And they agreed. So the Bible says there in Acts 5, 40, 41, 42, that they threatened the apostles. They beat them up. They sent them away. And look at their response. It says when they went back to their own company, and they told them what had happened, they counted it, that they were, they counted themselves worthy, that they were so blessed to suffer shame. They counted it an honor to suffer shame for his name. It was an honor to suffer shame for his name. Think about that. Maybe in your office, in your school, wherever you are, people may laugh at you, mock at you. Call, say mean things, you know, just because of your faith in Jesus, just because you're living by the Bible, maybe because you stand, take a stand of integrity or, or, or something you do because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they may laugh at you, mock at you, but you count it an honor to suffer shame for His name. Say, so God, thank you. At least this little bit I could suffer. Amen. Don't come and say, Pastor. They're calling me names. Please help me. No. Count it an honor that you can suffer shame for his name's sake. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess your name before my Father who is in heaven. If you're not ashamed of me on earth, I will not be ashamed of you in heaven. We need some people like that. Amen. All of us need to be like that. That we count it an honor if we have the privilege of suffering shame for his name. And what do they do? Verse 42 says, And daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In other words, they said, Hey, you say what you want. You do what you want. We are unstoppable. We are going. They just kept preaching, teaching, Jesus Christ every day. Amen? That's what you and I should do. Keep proclaiming Jesus. 
So now we move to Acts chapter 6 as a small chapter. We have a second problem happening in Acts chapter 6. And try to understand the situation there in the 6th chapter of Acts. You have this great community of people, maybe by this time, 20,000 people. Because the Bible has been saying great multitudes have been being added, great multitudes, about 20,000. We don't know. It's only an estimate. The minority are the locals. They are the Hebrew, Hebrews. They are from Jerusalem and in the district of Judea around Jerusalem. They're locals. They're Jews. But they primarily speak Aramaic or Hebrew. That's what they primarily speak. The majority are foreigners, Jews from other parts of the dispersion. They've come from all other parts, from Persia. They've come from Turkey, modern day Turkey. They come from Northern Africa. They've come from Cyprus, the island of the Mediterranean. They come from across the Mediterranean. They're all there. So the majority are referred to as Hellenists or Hellenistic. That means they are Greek cultured because all across the Roman Empire, they spoke Greek. That was the trade language. And they also spoke the language of which were place they were in. But they were, they were Jews, but they had adapted to the culture of wherever they were growing up. And they spoke Greek. So now they were all here in Jerusalem and in and around Jerusalem. Majority are Hellenists, Greek-speaking Jews. The minority, but the leaders, the apostles themselves, are Hebrews speaking. And so in the, morning, in the daily distribution of food, the widows are having a problem. The widows of the Hellenists, or the Greek speaking, the foreigners, they feel they're being neglected. We're not getting the same number of mutton pieces. Look, that plate of biryani has three mutton pieces. I'm just making it up. And they, they, they're disputing about how they're being treated. And, and so this tells us a very important lesson. You know, Paul wrote later to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. He said, do nothing out of partiality. And we try to, you know, right from the very beginning, we've tried to maintain that. You know, that everybody at APC are treated equally. So we all sit on the same kind of plastic chairs. We all sit on the same level grounds. Treated the same way. No special treatment for anybody. Treat everyone equally. The same things apply to everybody in any matter. Everybody's treated equally. So this was a problem because there was unfairness which probably happened, so they observed that. And the fact that there was this cultural difference, you know, contributed to it being more. And so the complaint came to the apostles. What did they do? So the apostles, definitely led by God, led by the Holy Spirit, said, okay, we're not going to get involved in the daily distribution of food. You select seven men. From among you. Here's the criteria. They should be men of good report. I mean, they should have a good testimony. Second, they should be full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. Now think about this. You know, what are they going to do? They are going to oversee food distribution. But even to do that simple work, the standard was quite high. They got to be people of a good testimony. They got to be full of the Holy Spirit. And they have to be full of wisdom. How? Huh? You know, that's a good lesson for us to learn. You may be a volunteer. You say, what are you doing? I'm just arranging chairs. We need people of good testimony, full of wisdom, and full of the Holy Spirit to arrange chairs. It may be simple work. But who we are. We are representing Jesus. Amen? So that's what the apostles said. You, you select seven men. And so they, they selected these seven men. And the apostles, you know, they said this. Acts 6 verse, verse 
verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to the ministry of the word and prayer. That's a big lesson for us. That we focus, those of us who are called to spiritual ministry, focus on that. Whatever you can delegate, give it away. Let others handle it. It's not that you want to be a big boss. No. You want to focus. Put your energies on things that matter. Things that others can do, let them do it. That's what, and it started right there in Acts 6. Now in the book of Acts, at that time the word deacon or helps or administration, those words are not used. It just says there were seven men and they were given the responsibility to distribute food. But eventually what we see unfolding as we journey through in Romans 12 verses 4 through 6, in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28, also in Romans 16 verse 1, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8 onwards, Paul describes the role of what we call as deacons. He describes the role of administrations, of helps. That means these are people who are, you know, what we would call, they're doing supportive ministry. You all with me or you got lost? Okay. They're doing support work, supporting the ministry. And so, you know, although the word deacon is not used in Acts 6, we can say that these represent what we would call as deacons. People are called to support the ministry of the church. And yet the standard was quite high. And the other thing I want to point out is the mix of these seven people. Although it's not stated there, and we necessarily cannot prove it, but most Bible scholars will tell us that by going by the names of these seven people, it's likely that they were Hellenists, not Hebrews. That means the, the people themselves and the apostles received them. He said, let's bring in the foreigners to be part of the leadership or, you know, take responsibility here. They were Hellenists. They were Greek speaking. And in fact, the name of the last man, I think it was Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. That means he was not even a Jew. He was a Greek who became a Jew, a proselyte. And he was from Antioch. So keep this in your mind. The apostles are Hebrews. Now they've been given seven men who are Hellenists, foreigners, to be prayed over and appointed to be responsible for the ministry in the church. What's the point? The point is that in our leadership, we need to have diversity. Uh, don't, don't, I know it's a big word outside in, in corporate, but what I'm saying is we need to have people from all kinds of places. Welcome them in. As long as they are of good report, full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. And we don't pick people only from one state. Only if you're from this state, you can be a leader. No, 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 no. You're full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. They are a good report. Be a part of it. And that's the way we are trying to do here at APC. You look at our leadership team. You look at our people serving here. We are from all parts of the world. Some from other planets maybe. But <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But <laughs> we got a, sorry. I know I've got to get a message from my wife later on. But <laughs> cut, cut, cut. <laughs> but we have good mix. Just, just welcome people. So, and that's, we see that beginning to happen right there in Acts 6. And what happened? What was the result? It says, and the word of God increased. And now it says, and a great multitude of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, even priests got saved. So think of it. The very leadership of the religious leadership, they are, they, that's being shaken. They are becoming believers now. The very people who are opposing the gospel. Priests are becoming saved, coming to faith in Jesus. You all with me so far? And then we see focus on one man. His name is Stephen. Acts 6 was 8. And Stephen full of faith and power, 
did great signs and wonders among the people. Who was Stephen? Given charge of distributing food. Who was Stephen? Head of administration. Events. Who was Stephen? Head of ushering. Who was Stephen? Head of offertory counting. Who was Stephen? He's doing something. But he was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles among the people. What's the point? It doesn't matter what you're, you're doing. You may be counting money, doing offertory counting. Do your offertory counting. Be full of faith and power and let God do signs and wonders. You may be arranging books. Yeah, you arrange books, but be full of faith and power and let God do signs, wonders and miracles through you. You may be arranging chairs. Wonderful. Arrange them well and you also do signs, wonders and miracles. In other words, God can work through everyone. Amen? You don't have to be an apostle to work signs, wonders and miracles. See, you're just serving food. I can imagine Take this biryani, God heal him. You know, take this, God. People being healed, people being ministered. So it doesn't matter what, what you're doing. Do it well, simple, do it well. And God can work powerfully through you. Just keep yourself full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And God will work powerfully through you. And to this man, Stephen, who was given the role or responsibility to distribute food, the Bible says, obviously he started coming into the forefront and there was the synagogue of the freedmen, meaning this was a synagogue that, you know, those days, different groups, different people, they had their own synagogues where they would worship. And this was a synagogue where the Jews from certain parts of the world, it says they're from Cyrene, which was uh, from northern Africa, and from Cilicia, which was uh, mid of mid southern part of Turkey. Cilicia was a district where Tarsus was, which was a city from where Saul came. So the Jews from these parts were part of the synagogue, and they began to debate with Stephen. So Stephen is preaching about Jesus. They are debating with Stephen. But the Bible says that they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They couldn't resist. That here a simple man who was serving food, full of the Holy Spirit, was exuding wisdom as he spoke about Jesus Christ, given to him by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so the only thing they could do, they did to him what they did to Jesus. They brought some false charges against him. This man is speaking against Moses and against the law. Yeah, brought some charges, accusations. And so now Stephen becomes, worship team, please come. Stephen becomes the first believer, non-apostle, the first believer to be brought to trial. So now he's brought before the Sanhedrin. Gamaliel is there. Saul is there. Other people are there. And Stephen is standing. And Acts chapter 6 ends with this beautiful verse. And they saw the face of Stephen. And his face was like that of an angel. In other words, God was doing something supernatural at that moment. Stephen, you're standing on trial. But you're standing on trial for Jesus. And I'm with you. He put a heavenly glow on this man. And he saw this man. His face like was that of an angel. Something different. The presence of God coming through. The one other person that we read about in the Old Testament. Moses where the glory of God shone through him. And here we are. Stephen standing trial. And the glory of God shining through him. Amen. Next Sunday, we pick up in Acts chapter 7 and 8. We see what happens to Stephen, his defense, and what happens after that. Key takeaways from Acts 5 and 6. First, 
Walk with godly reverence. There is great grace, great glory, but God expects great fear or great reverence for God. We pray that we will be a church like Acts 12, Acts 5, 12 to 16. God, we want to be like this. Where mighty things are done and multitudes come from different parts of the world to receive of what you're doing. We are bold like the apostles. And like Peter said, we obey God in proclaiming Jesus. We proclaim the risen Christ. And we are His witnesses and the Holy Spirit with us. Not afraid. Acts 6. We treat everyone fairly and equally. No partiality. As we build the leadership, we make it diverse. We bring in whoever God has anointed, appointed, qualified. Let God raise up the leaders from wherever He chooses. Whatever you're doing, remember, if you just stay full of faith and power, and God will do wonderful things through you as He did through Stephen. He can use you. Just stay full of faith, full of power, and He'll work through you. And like Stephen, we are ready to stand up for Jesus. Amen? Yes, let's literally start, please. As we take this time, the last few moments, I want you to open your heart and if there's anything that you heard this morning that has spoken to you personally, talk to God about it. You've been stirred up about something. You feel challenged about something. Maybe you feel stirred in your heart and say, God, I want to be bold, unashamed. I want to be able to count it an honor to be known as a believer, as a Christian, as a person who loves Jesus. I count it an honor to bear your name. I count it an honor to even suffer shame for your name. If you feel certain in your heart, saying, God, work through me. I'm just a simple believer. I'm just simply doing some small thing, whatever's given to me. But Lord, like Stephen, help me be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, so that you can work wonderful things through my life, signs and wonders and miracles. Do mighty things through me. I'm available. I'm ready. Let the truth of your kingdom, Lord, let it reign in me, let it reign through me. And Holy Spirit, we invite you, we pray that you will move upon us. We pray that you'll make us like Acts 5, 12 to 16. That we will be a community where the power of God will be displayed, where there will be great grace and great glory. And we will, we will walk in godly reverence of our great God. God, that people will come in here and receive healing, receive, receive deliverance, and that you'll have complete freedom to do whatever you wish to do, however you wish to do it. Even if it is outside our frame of reference. Even if it is unusual, even if it's uncommon, even if it's something we don't understand, do it. Work as you please. Work as you please. And Father, even in our lives, work miracles, work healings. Even now as we stand here in your presence, Holy Spirit, heal. Holy Spirit, deliver. Holy Spirit, encourage. Holy Spirit, lift off things that are heavy on our hearts and minds. Let things that are weighing down on our minds be lifted up, Lord, be taken off. And God, shape us, form us, make us. Make us vessels that are fit for the master's use. We are earthen vessels. But the Bible says the treasure 
inside of us is of God. It's not of us. We recognize we are earthen vessels. But what's in us is of God. God has put this heavenly treasure in earthen vessels. And you are that earthen vessel. You are that earthen vessel. You're carrying a heavenly treasure. What's in you is of God. And no man, no devil can stop it. No man, no devil can stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. We praise you. We praise you. Let's worship.
sing that again, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. And as we sing it, I want you to expect God to touch you. There's healing that you need, a deliverance that you need, a miracle that you need. As we sing the song again, I want you to expect the Holy Spirit to touch you. He is the mighty God, the great God. He's right there with you. He's omnipresent. He's right there with you. Those watching online, wherever you are, expect the Holy Spirit to touch you. Whatever healing you need, whatever deliverance you need, whatever miracle you need, expect God to do that in you, for you. We're going to sing this again and expect that to happen. your presence thank you for the weight of your glory in this place and God even now let healings manifest let miracles manifest let deliverances take place under the weight of your glory we're here as we're standing here let healings take place let miracles take place let people receive your healing touch let every work of the enemy dis be destroyed. Let every tormenting, oppressive spirit of darkness run in terror from the weight of your glory in this place. The weight of your glory be manifest. We thank you, God. Let hearts be changed, minds be changed, and lives be changed in this place. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you. The release of your miracles. The release of your presence for the release of your power. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We're going to close. If you received something, that God touched you in a personal way, very special way, we invite you to send your testimony. Send an email to testimony at apcwo.org. Tell us what God did. I would be happy to share it with others. So this is what God is doing in our midst. Let's close.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with us always. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.